one of the blessings of of experience is you know you stop paying attention to dumb criticism and you realize it just doesn't matter hey it's ryan holiday my guest today is one of the goats of nonfiction, greatest of all time journalists writers public speakers podcast too i mean he's he's an incredible i want to say renaissance man because i feel like it's all about the same core skill but just an incredible storyteller and thinker and someone i've very much looked up to for a long time i remember i first read the tipping point that i read blink then outliers then david and goliath which is also very good but then when i read talking with strangers last year i read it Actually, before last year, I read it when I was on my book tour for Stillness is the Key. I remember I shot him an email and I said, Malcolm, this book is like the definition of mastery. It's like watching a master at work. He took this subject matter that should have been so difficult and frankly, not interesting. And it's fascinating. And, and his new book, I would argue, is a much more interesting subject matter than any of the other books. The bombing campaign, the final days of the Second World War in the Pacific Theater and again, manages to find a very counterintuitive read on it. And if that weren't enough, if you haven't listened to the Revisionist History podcast, so good. Listen to his one about golf courses. Just a mind-blowing episode. He, he always finds like the story inside the story or where you didn't even think there was a story. And that's why he's Malcolm Gladwell. That's why people describe things as Gladwellian because he's in a class of his own. It's a distinctive style, tone, approach. And as I say, at the end of this episode, he also has a lovely, fascinating voice, and uh, it's just a pleasure to listen to. So today, my guest is the one and only Malcolm Gladwell, uh, The Tipping Point, Blink, Outliers, David and Goliath, Talking with Strangers, and now his new book, The Bomber Mafia. And of course, if you haven't listened to Revisionist History, you absolutely must. Here's my interview talking about history, philosophy, endurance, sports, uh, critical infrastructure, like infrastructure that criticizes art, culture, etc. And then we get into a little fascinating discussion about vaccines and vaccine hesitancy at the end. Uh, I loved this episode. I loved talking to Malcolm Gladwell. Enjoy. First question. Do you run in the morning or do you run in the afternoons? Uh, I run in the afternoon. Always have. Never in the morning. Never, not even like when you're traveling? Never. So, so do you write first and then run? Yes, right. Morning is thinking time. And um, so it's, uh, it's creative time. And seems crazy to put a run in the middle of the most cognitively valuable stretch of the day. I agree, except if I think it's unlikely I'll be able to run in the afternoon because the day is not sort of mine to control. Sometimes I'll get it done early. And yeah. then I've crossed it off the list. But do you find that when you go for a run, like, so let's say you spent all morning writing, whether it went well or it went poorly, do you find that running unlocks things for you creatively that that takes you back to writing or, or helps you the next day? Or are they totally unrelated pursuits for you? Well, you know, I imagine it does unlock things, but not in a conscious way. Sure. I mean, it has to help, right? But um. I just don't know whether you can you can ever know how it's helping. Any kind of extended time, like I typically run by myself and I run without music or any accompaniment. Really? Yeah, I never. So it's you know I, I feel like it's just a it's like it's like a form of meditation. It's just letting my mind wander. I think is that what you is that what you're doing? Is your mind wandering, or are you thinking about very specific things? Like, are you in control, or is is it? nothing no i'm usually daydreaming um or if i'm doing a really hard like a track workout then i'm a little more locked in but if i'm just going um just for a kind of easy run i'm letting my mind wander or i'm just thinking about various random things it's very similar to the kind of thinking i do before i go to sleep it's that that's the analogy, I think. And do you, why don't you listen to music or, you know, some people, I, I'm sure you hear from people all the time that say, you know, I listen to your audiobooks when I'm running. I, I, I am baffled by people's ability to consume this podcast episode or any sort of conversation while they're running. 
Yeah, I, I'm with you. I had never figured out the logistics of it. I don't like where would I put my? F- it's on my phone. Am I really going to carry my phone on a ten mile run? That seems nuts. Um, but also, I don't even know. It's never you can do it on the Apple Watch. I think that's what a lot of people do. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I just never even occurs to me to to. I mean, it's just like there's so little time. Like when even when I'm driving, I only ever listen to something on the car in the car at the end of the day never in the morning and well, I, I think like it's precious time you have with your own thoughts yeah and i think for a writer that's when you're sharpest it, you know is sort of in the morning before the crap of the day has entered your world and so to to willingly like mainline other people's thoughts or information strikes me as uh a bad idea yeah yeah it's just disruptive um, Although I, I read that you write in coffee shops, probably not during COVID, but I, I can't be around. I don't want anyone in the space. I want kind of like a sacred, quiet space. So it's interesting. Oh, I, that, love, yeah. I love the I love the company and the noise. But remember, I began my career as a newspaper reporter in at the Washington Post in a big, loud, crowded newsroom. And that's what I associate with, right? You know, I love that energy. I fell in love with that energy. And so I try, I could, I recreate it as best as I can in, um, in, in coffee shops. So I like having, and also I like variety. So I'll move around over the course of the day and write in four different places, you know, my desk being one of them, but then I need that kind of to change it up a little bit. Well, it's like, I imagine maybe it's a little bit like ambient noise, like someone who grew up in the city listening to sort of city noises on a white noise machine or someone who grew up near the ocean needs to hear waves. Yeah, yeah. I think it's that that kind of, um, uh, and I, 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 I've never had, the thing is, when I'm actually writing, so little of my life is actually writing. Sure. This is what people don't understand about writers, which is that, you know, our writing takes up a tiny fraction of, And I find that I'm very unconflicted about the writing part of my, um, so I don't, you know, it's, I never, I really never get writer's block or it's very kind of, um, it's just so, uh, so pleasurable to construct something for me that, um, you know, it's it's fine if there's things going on around me, I'm, I'm locked in. I don't, it doesn't sort of affect my process. So let's say for scheduling reasons or you're sick or weather or whatever, I, I'm curious for you, what's more painful? Like what leaves you more blocked up? Not being able to write, research, build stuff for a few days or not being able to get out and physically exercise, like run or work out? Which one, if you had to, to sort of deprive yourself of one, which, which would you choose? Oh, uh, that's easy. Um, depriving myself of physical activity is way more painful than depriving myself of. Um, Cause I, you know, if I, I was just on, took a little three day holiday, I did some work, but mostly just read books. That was like, totally, I don't, I could have read books the entire time. I could not have not gone for a run in that time. That would have been painful. So what is that? Isn't it an addiction? Because I suffer the same thing. It's, I was talking to, do you know who Dean Carnazis is? He's oh, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, that it's hard. We were talking about it's harder for me to not go for a run because I'm sick, because I'm hurt, because it's somebody's birthday or something. It's harder to not run than to run. Like it takes more willpower to not do it than to do yeah. it at this point. Yeah. Although it's funny. Does it take, I mean, I enjoy my day. So I, I, because I'm old, I, I run, you know, two days on at most three days on and then one day off. So I'm, I have plenty of off days and I don't, they don't, they're not painful for me. I'm quite happy. I mean, tomorrow I'm not running. Um, I don't have a problem with that. That doesn't make me, sure. but, you know, I'll just, so it's not, it's not that it's just like, um, I don't know. It's hard to describe the place. I had a, the son of a friend of mine came was passing through and stayed overnight at my house uh, yesterday. And I, we went for a run in the afternoon. I never run with him before. Typically like I, cause I 
way upstate. I run do my most of the running by myself. It was a beautiful day, and we went on this kind of there's this new trail near where I live. This beautiful, you know, crushed stone trail that goes for miles. And you know, we started really easy, and then we just decided to pick it up on the way back. It was just like so great. I mean, it's just no other. Sure. You know, we went from started just over eight minute mile pace, ended up at six minute mile pace. And it was just like, I don't know, there's just nothing beats that. I don't, I just, I was just happy for the rest of the day. It was just so satisfying. Um, I think it connects to something very primal. It's like, you're sort of like, this is what uh, the body was meant to do. Yes. And for some reason I'm aware as I've, actually, I was going to say, it's always been this case. I've been, and maybe I have no idea what this is true of all runners. Maybe it is. I, my running is incredibly variable. So I can have days where I'm on fire and I have days where it, it's a real slug. I, and I don't, I can't point to a rational reason why in both those instances, I may have had a full night's sleep. I may be perfectly happy in my life. I may, but you know, sometimes it's a struggle and yesterday was one of those days where it was not a struggle. It was just, I could have run forever. I mean, it was, um, uh, when I was a kid, there was a period where, uh, when I was 15 years old, which was the best, my, I stopped running competitively at 15. Um, but uh, right before I stopped, I was in, there was a stretch of about two weeks where I was in the greatest shape I'd ever been up to that point. And I've never been in that kind of shape again. And I had that feeling every day that I, nothing, I could just run forever as fast as I wanted. I've always remembered that. It was like the most magical period of my entire life. I think back on some of the workouts I was doing in that window, it's just incredible. Like it just, I was just in a state of physical flow. Um, what's, weird, it away. what's weird is that writing and running are kind of on opposite trajectories. So running you kind of get worse at it as you get older to, to some degree and that the body is rebelling and breaking down as you get older. But writing uh, is unique, I would imagine, uh, I, would, I would argue uh, unique among the artistic or cultural pursuits in that you not only do you tend to get better at it the longer you do it, but also society and the market accepts the output of your work longer. So a musician, you know, you, you start, you hit your mid thirties, musicians start to be irrelevant culturally, the they're moving on to the younger person, but, but a writer could hit their stride at 40 or 50 or 60. I was just reading about Janet Malcolm, uh, who, who died yesterday. It's like her first book was published at like 40 or 45 or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's, they're kind of opposite pursuits. I like that writing, you know, you could be, you could be at your absolute peak at Robert Caro's age. And uh, it's a, it's a very forgiving pursuit in that sense. Yeah, no, it's um, it. That's the, I didn't realize that when I started and now I realize, Oh my goodness, the best possible profession to age, to age in. Um, although writing, running, I would quibble with your, I find running to be far more pleasurable now. Um, now the only, the, that I did when I was a kid. The only problem is you're, you, I guess you're more likely to get injured when you're older. Although I was injured all the time when I was young. So I'm not even sure that's true. Um, it's more I, forgiving I, than basketball. I just mean, uh, yes. it, it's, it's probably more pleasurable as you get older, but it, it's not, you, you can do it as, and, and even some of the best runners in the world are competing at an elite level later than a lot of the other yeah. sports, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, I mean, I hope still to be shuffling around when I'm 80. I mean, assuming that my, you know, joints all hold up. Um, I think I, I, I think I should be able to do this for a long time. Do you feel that with writing as far as aging into the profession? I mean, I, I think I messaged you this when I read Talking With Strangers and it just felt like this was watching a master at work. And not, at, not that the other books weren't good. They were very, very good. But I would argue that, the subject matter of talking with strangers, and then also with the Bomber Mafia, these are much, uh, the other subject matter, it was easier to make a great book out of. You were, you were dealing with harder material. So for it to be at the Malcolm Gladwell level or to just be at the readability level that they were 
with the raw materials you were working on on these harder books, it struck me as as really watching the culmination of uh, a person who'd done this a very long time. Yeah, I do feel like I've gotten. I do feel that I do feel like there is some cumulative benefit of my experience now that I can see. I have a lot. I I have a lot of confidence now, um, particularly the podcast. You know, in f- I'm in my uh, sixth season. We're just finishing up our sixth season now. So that's 10 episodes a season. That's 60 episodes in six years. Each episode is roughly, let's say, 7,000 words. That's like a lot of words. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like, and I feel like that kind of has, has uh, sped up the process of, of mastery. Um, Interesting. And I've... I just have a lot of confidence now that I can find. And also because I'm in the podcast world, you have more help. So I just, you know, the combination is now much more of a team activity and that and in combination with my own kind of experience, it's, it feels a lot different and it feels a lot easier. Sure. Um, And uh, I'm not, you know, I enter these seasons and I'll have, I have to be done by the end of June. And in January, February, I'll have no ideas. Like I couldn't have handled that at 30. Um, I can sort of handle that now. I've raved about Athletic Greens before with all the things we've all got going on, trying to, to work, stay healthy, stay strong, work out. It's hard to get the right mix of nutrients in your diet. And Athletic Greens is a great product. I actually first heard of Athletic Greens almost 10 years ago from Chris the Kiwi, the founder. He and I met through Tim Ferriss. He's a great dude. Athletic Greens has more than 75 vitamins, minerals, and other whole food sourced ingredients that make it easier for you to maintain nutrition without taking a whole lot of pills. You just mix a scoop of Athletic Greens into some water and you're good to go. They're offering my audience a free one-year supply of vitamin D. Plus, you'll get five free travel packs with your first purchase. Simply visit athleticgreens.com slash stoic Join us in making this commitment to your health. Just go to athleticgreens.com slash stoic and get your free year supply of vitamin D plus five free travel packs today. Even though you're not interacting with the audience the same way, I think there's also something empowering and educational about working at scale. Like I think this podcast has done 50 million downloads. I, I could write my whole life and not reach 50 million people. I mean, that's like an insane number. And so you you do learn something also by like putting stuff out, hearing from the audience, seeing what's working, not working. <laughs> that like even a like a book that sells a million copies is like you know an album that sells fifteen or twenty million copies, right? It's so rare to reach that scale, and so books have always been this kind of I don't want to say a ghetto, but it's a it's a smaller niche um, that you don't you don't get the sense of what's working for large amounts of people the same way I feel like you do in audio. Yeah. 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 I think that's true. Or at least they're very, um, they're so, I, I had thought when I started that what a podcast was, was simply a book that you read mm-hmm. like my kinds of podcasts, narrative podcasts. Yeah. But now I, I realize it's a completely different animal that's experienced in a different way that, um, it's a different kind of storytelling. It's remembered differently. It's, you know, it's much, um, I don't know. I can't, I'm still kind of fumbling with my appreciation of, of how different it is. But it, the more I do revisionist history, the more I, I just think this is like a, this is a whole different animal than I was doing before. All that, all that thing has in common is that I'm doing it, but that's it. Other than that, it's like, it's like, I mean, I, I feel like I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, a, a guitar player who, who took up the trombone at 50. It, it's a unique medium too, in that it's long form and yet not viral. So you're not worried about how it spreads in the same way that you are with an article, even a book you want sort of word of mouth. There is something special about like you have an audience, they subscribe, 
you push it out to them. So it really can kind of be whatever you want. There's a large audience, but you're not subject to the pressures of the internet or even like the, 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 the bestseller market. And, and I think that's why such good content comes out of podcasts for the most part is that it kind of exists in one chunk as opposed, even like talk radio is like sort of live. And, and if you're not holding the attention, they turn off or switch to a different channel. It's kind of immune from these wicked incentives that I think have ruined some other mediums. Yeah. And also uh, it's this wonderful. So there's no critical infrastructure for a podcast, right? There's no, sure. uh, there's not even a really a bestseller list. I mean, there kind of is, but not really. Right. There's no, Nobody knows what it means, what what the ranks mean, how many downloads it is. Nobody knows. They're not podcast critics who publish regular things that everyone reads. There's no. And what we're getting is a kind of a little case study in what happens to creativity in the absence of criticism. And the results suggest, to my mind as well, at least, that um, the the. Um, the contribution of the critical infrastructure to writing, to publishing, may be greatly overstated. That the world would actually be, if there were no movie reviewers, maybe movies would be better. If there were no book reviewers, maybe we'd, people would take more chances. I'm not, with the kind of creative flowering you see in, the, in this new medium, um, in the absence of some kind of institutional reviewing function, suggest to me that maybe these reviewers were screwing things up. They weren't helping. I mean, I would totally argue that they are. Even to go back to publishing, this is always something I've, I've uh, noticed about your books. Um, your books appear on the New York Times nonfiction list, whereas almost all of the rest of us operating in very similar spaces get jammed in the advice how-to nonfiction ghetto where we're competing with the uh, Guinness Book of World Records and, uh, you know, the, the no belly fat diet books and, and all this other stuff. And like, what is that distinction? Who decided that, you know, what Malcolm Gladwell writes is, is highbrow enough to be uh, nonfiction and then basically anyone else writing nonfiction that, that has, you know, even a sliver of advice in it, you know, gets put in the, in the miscellaneous bucket and yet that determines so many other things. And, and it's just like some random person probably made this decision all these years ago. And the, uh, the, the downstream consequences of that is it sort of has to do with rankings and all this other stuff. It's, it is interesting, even, even the bestseller list, I, I always find it funny, like if you look at the fine print of the, the New York Times bestseller list, it excludes like books that are assigned in school. It, assi it, it excludes like, um, uh, perennial sellers. And it, it excludes things that should be on the list every, every week or every month. And so people end up inevitably trying to gain incentives, right? Uh, and I think your point about there not really being anything to gain with podcasts means all that energy gets focused on just making stuff that people want to make. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah, I agree. I mean, this kind of like um, the, 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 inf the existing in publishing infrastructure is super creaky. It's just like, it hasn't people, even something as dumb as, I mean, we're sort of getting in the weeds here, but the New York Times list is a list of print books. And then they also have a list of eBooks. They don't fold in your audiobooks. Right. But audiobooks, out, in, many, in, my, in my case, I sell more audiobooks than print books. It's like 30 or 40% of sales of, of most yeah. books. In my case, it's 60% of sales. So like, I don't understand, like, why does the New York Times think that they should count my print book, but not my audiobook? I mean, I just don't, I mean, it's just, it's just like dumb. Or, or uh, why is Amazon weighted, disp uh, underweighted, but independent bookstores are overweighted? Meanwhile, I think, you know, independent book sales, and I have an independent bookstore, is like one or 2% of my total sales. So, so yeah, somebody decided, that because they love indie bookstores, that's going to be disproportionately weighted on the you list. Have an, you have an you have an indie bookstore. Yeah, I have a small bookstore uh, in this small town here in Texas. Really? Yeah. So I was. I, uh, I'm talking to you from my office, which is above the bookstore. I needed like an office space to write, and so I, I I bought this small building, and beneath it is a storefront, and I opened a bookstore. What town in Texas do you live in? Uh, Bastrop, Texas, which is right outside Austin. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I know Bastrop. 
Oh, yeah. wow. I go to Austin all the time. I should come and... Uh, you should. I should come and check out your bookstore. We, we, have all, we have all your books. They're very popular. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. But that's yeah, it's, it, it's strange how, you know, again, this sort of arbitrary criteria, which is, I guess, kind of the, the, um, uh, the through line of a lot of your books. What is the underlying hidden logic of how a lot of systems or people or assumptions operate? And it's not usually what people think. There's usually something going on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's funny. Yeah, I am that that kind of um, side of it always has um, fascinated me. I'm doing a the next big project I'm doing is on the um, LAPD. It's a kind of history of the LAPD, but it's an, a different kind of history of the LAPD. It's, I'm trying to describe how did one of the great American institutions go wrong, and it's really at the you know when we talk about police. Um, problematic police behavior in this country. We often talk, not always, but we often talk about it in terms of bad people, you know, like uh, like the guy in Minneapolis, you know, sure. um, uh, you know, who's just a bad actor. And we think we need to get rid of the bad actors. But the focus of my book is not on bad people, but on bad systems. Sure. And how if you look very closely at the history of the LAPD, you realize that there's a kind of an original sin in the way the, the institution was set up in the 30s. And the results, the consequences of that um, warped the way the city was policed for two generations. And it took an, a heroic effort to change that. And it's like, it's such a kind of like, and it, people, Almost no one talked about this for 60 years. I mean, it just never came up. And they were always talking about, well, is there something wrong with the cops? Is there something wrong with the, are the people just who complain about the cops just complainers? Are they, you know, there was a million, maybe this problem doesn't exist. There was a million explanations given for what was, for, for the, to try and identify the dysfunction in Los Angeles. And the, the truth was like, there in plain sight, but it just was in a form that no one, no one wanted to think about. It's, it's all about this, the way the city charter is written. It's like the nerdiest thing, but that, that's it, that's at the core. It set up a system which perpetuated itself for 50 years. That, um, that was my favorite part of the new Michael Lewis book, The, the Premonition, where, um, I don't know if you, if you remember this part, but like, they were trying to find out some something about droplets and what size droplets were. Uh, and and there had always been this assumption in epidemiology that had come from a very specific thing. And someone was like, well, let's go find what study that's based on. And nobody could. They found it. Ultimately, it was traced back to like this obscure book. And it might have been a typo. You know, it, it, it's always interesting that it was like, one guy, because it's usually, unfortunately, a guy, some guy laid down a rule or a law as you said, like 60 years ago, and everything is descended from that. It's all fruit from the poison tree, but it doesn't feel like that because nobody even remembers who that person was and that they would have had so much power at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fascinating. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Upstate earlier. I meant to thank you. I I, I believe your neighbor up there, Charles Randolph, is... Uh, mm -hmm. You, he told me that you were the one that recommended that he do the screenplay about one of my books. Uh, I wrote a book about Peter Thiel and Gawker. Oh, yeah. Um, and he said it was you that recommended it. Um, he may be being overly generous, but uh, I um, he Charles is one of my best friends. Yeah, he, he's, he, he, he lives 100 yards from me. He's a... Um, uh, I thought it was, yeah, that was a, that was a really, really interesting book. Yeah, and they're... they're um, uh, I don't know where the what the status of the movie is at the. At I have the no moment. idea either. Yeah, yeah. No, Charles is a genius, very brilliant guy. Yeah, no. I, the the screenplay he did was amazing. Hopefully, hopefully it ultimately gets made. But um, all right. So a couple more questions. So uh, the knock against you uh, when 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 usually sort of jealous academics are are mad at Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, you get something that I get as well, which is is to go, oh, he's just a popularizer. Um, this strikes me as a preposterously 
complimentary insult. Uh, why do people think that that would be a bad thing? Isn't that the whole job of writing? Yeah, I've never understood that. Um, it's it's like, uh, well, you know, it's funny. I think that that there is something else going on here, which is in part legitimate, which is, and I'll use a running example. Every now and again, there'll be an article about running written for a popular audience by someone who you realize happened through the article is not themselves a runner. And there's always a moment when I read an article like that, when I get so angry, how did they, what are they talking about? How could they possibly say that? What, blah, blah, blah. And then I stop and I say, oh, no, 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 Malcolm, don't get angry. Because there, this is a, um, a structural feature of journalism. That is the insider is always going to be unhappy with the account of their world written by the outsider, necessarily. One, because the outsider can never get all the nuance, um, but also the outsider who's writing about your world is not writing for you. I should remember this lesson. If there's an article about running in the you know, New York Times Magazine, don't read it, Malcolm. It's, it's not, not for you. Make you happy. It's not for you. Like if they're writing about, I think there was maybe some article years ago about Mary Kane, that there was just so much stuff that annoyed me about it. But then I realized it's for people who don't know about Mary Kane. Or there was an article about, um, one that I always remember, drove me so crazy. It was an article about um, uh, uh, whether trans, it was uh, that whole argument, uh, the thing about whether trans athletes should be um, allowed to compete alongside, um, you know, in conventional gender categories. And at one point they were talking about, well, what role, what is the added benefit of um, having higher male levels of testosterone? And the person writing the article said, you know, it's trivial. It's only about like 2% or 3%, you know, and as a runner, so that I was like, oh my God, 3% is everything. It's the whole, it's the difference between being first and last, but it's between making the Olympic team and not even making the final. That but could be I several thought, minutes in a marathon. Yeah, it's like huge. Yeah. But I, you know, that is an egregious mistake. But at the same time, um, the same rule applies. It's not to the kind of person, it was otherwise a very intelligent article trying to introduce people who'd never thought about this issue to this issue. Um, and it's fine if not everything is perfect. It's not the point, you know, the people reading it are not gonna be the ones passing judgment on this very complicated issue. This article is simply saying, here's your introduction. If you're, and if you're interested in this, you'll read more. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you'll correct, you'll understand eventually the three percent's a lot, right? You'll get there. But like, so I think of th what's happening with you, people like you and I, is that the same thing. The insider's reading it, and of course they're gonna see a nuance that we didn't see, but they should just like chill. Yes. <laughs> because it's not for them. Well, you'll you'll see it. Someone will go like, don't read Ryan, go read the original Stoics. And to me, that would be the equivalent of like, don't read Malcolm Gladwell go read hundreds of scientific journal articles. Nothing could make you or I happier than millions of people deciding to be as nerdy and dedicated and, uh, and detailed about their, what they read as that. Yeah. Also, realistically, that's never gonna happen. If, it, if, if everyone loved journal articles, we wouldn't have books. We just all read journal articles. Like they're, I think people struggle with the idea that not everyone has the time or energy or, or frankly, the ability to go as in-depth as a topic. And they have to start somewhere just as you didn't start with journal entries. And, and I, you know, everyone has to start with a general introduction to something. And why would, like, I always get, I always get mad to, not mad, I, people go like, uh, you know, uh, people in Silicon Valley are reading Ryan Holiday's, uh, you know, books about stoicism. And it's like, of all the things they could be reading that you would be upset about, it seems like an ancient philosophy would be like the least bad thing for them to be consuming. Like for, of all the things that you could be popularizing, it's not like you're popularizing QAnon or, or, uh, or, you know, the law of attraction, you're, you're popularizing science and, and research. This is a good thing. Why, why be upset about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I kind of stopped paying attention. One of the blessings of 
of of uh, of experience is, you know, you stop paying attention to dumb criticism and you realize it just doesn't matter. It's not like the but the rule I always have is if you if you if you imagine um, as a, a hypothetical scenario that let's stipulate that 90 percent of the people who read your books love your books and 10 percent hate them. That's a very, very generous. I'm going to give you that. Sure. Right? Yeah. So if you sell 10 books, then you have one critic and nine people who love your books. No one's even going to notice that one critic, right? Right. If you sell a million books, you're going to have a hundred thousand critics, right? All we're going to be inundated with the critics of Ryan Holiday. But you sold a million books and yeah. you have nine hundred thousand people who love them. Now, which of those two, which 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 of those two scenarios do you want, right? Do you want to sell one? Do you want to have one critic or a hundred thousand critics? I want to have a hundred thousand critics. Right. The, the other feature of that is that the haters always hate more than the people who are fans of the 90 percent who like you. Most of them were like, oh, it was OK. Or, you know, I read that, uh, I, you know, Outliers, that's the one with the 10,000 hours. That's what I took away from the book. Right. Yeah. But the hater is the one who's obsessed Ooh. that on page 62, you made an you, you know, you made an assumption that they don't agree with. And therefore, mm. you know, you are the devil and I, they were going to spend all their time on the Internet letting everyone know. I tried a couple of years ago, I realized this. I realized that I was like everyone, far more free with my criticism than my praise. Mm -hmm. And I decided to make a concerted effort to be, to equalize that. So to, and so I started, you know, Janet, you just mentioned Janet Malcolm died yesterday. Janet Malcolm was, she was the most important influence in my own writing. I read really? every one of her books some of them more than once. I was obsessed with Jenna Malcolm. And I realized, oh, you know, I need to start telling the world this. So starting about five years ago, maybe even longer, whenever I was had an opportunity, I would say, and my five favorite writer is Janet Malcolm. And then finally, last year, I got a little note, a little handwritten note from Janet Malcolm saying, I heard you say on some, some friend of mine alerted me to some, you know, interview you gave where you said you, I was your favorite writer. I'm so touched, blah, blah, blah. blah. I was like, you know, that, I wish I'd started doing that 30 years ago. Yes. I, that, you know, she has been trapped in a world. She was in her seventies or eighties by that point. She'd been in this world where her haters were much louder than her, than her supporters. And the only way that's ever going to reverse is if people like me who like her work speak up, right? And, and better that you speak out while she's alive and she could actually hear about it. Yeah, it was the sweetest little note. I was like, I, met, I, I think I brightened her day. Like, it was like, I was so, I was so um, uh, thrilled to get that little note from her. No, that's a great rule. Okay, back to the insider thing. And then I want to talk about, about the new book. Um, I think one of the things you, you kind of just described there, and I might be pronouncing it wrong, but uh, what is it? The gel amnesia effect or the gel amnesia effect? Do you, do you know about this? No. I actually heard about it from Michael Lewis, but it's basically that whenever you read an article about something that you are in fact an, art, an expert about, you immediately see that the journalist or journalists in general have no idea what they're talking about and that you can't trust it. And so you read this about running or, 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 or you know, something in the market because you run a hedge fund or whatever it is that you're an expert about, you read it and you're just disgusted with how inaccurate it is. And then you turn to the next page or you click the next article and they tell you about an upcoming ruling of the Supreme Court and what it means or what's going on in the Middle East or the latest news about this scientific breakthrough. And you absorb it and trust it completely as if it is not uh, just as inaccurate to the insiders, but you are unaware of your own ignorance. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's so true. That's exactly what I'm talking about, because, you know, I will eagerly con you know, I'll be throwing my hands up over the Mary Kane article, and then I'll, you know, eagerly read every other article in, in the magazine. Yes. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Um, well, I, so I, I thought the new book was fascinating. Uh, again, it, it seems like maybe you're trying to challenge yourself to, to write about something that you must have known the vast majority of people were going to be upset about you for daring to talk about and for not sort of taking... I don't want to call it the party line, but 
but the sort of let's call it the the sort of liberal consensus about you know uh, this part of the Second World War. Were you trying to challenge yourself, or were you just you just compelled to tell this story? I mean, I was. I didn't think it's funny. I, from my perspective, I have never gotten such positive reviews for, on a book in my life. I'm used to getting. I have on many of my books run the table and got not a single major positive review. So that's my baseline. So this one, you know, I had. I've just been flabbergasted by how positive the response has been. Um, I wasn't trying to do anything controversial at all. I was, but I was trying to stretch myself in this, in the kind of story that I was telling. I wanted to tell a single narrative, um, which I've never done before at book length. I always have a book that has multiple narratives. Um, and I was like, you know what, can I, why can't I tell a story from beginning to end? Because I've always been in awe of someone like Michael Lewis who does that. And I don't understand how he could do it. Um, so that was the first thing. And I wanted to write a book that didn't, that withheld a conclusion. I wanted people to make up their own mind about um, what we should have done at the end of the Second World War or whether what Curtis LeMay did over Japan in the summer of 45 is a good or a bad thing. Because I'm not sure I know how to what to make of it. Um, and so I just thought I would lay out the two sides and let people um, interpret it as they may. Um, and I, I, I think that in by and large, that's what people have done is they've just accepted the fact that war presents you with a series of impossible choices. And they're no less impossible with the passage of time. I mean, it's not any easier to make sense of what was doing, what they were doing in 45 today than it was in 45. Um, so that's that was what I was trying to get at is, you know, I feel like this is the thing, thing I've actually begun to feel quite strongly about in many, um, the, this idea of degree of difficulty is the thing we have the hardest time with. And, you know, the I've seen this, you know, and all I've done a ton of writing about police and law enforcement in my life. And the thing I always come back to is most people who are not in law enforcement underestimate how difficult that job is. Similarly, uh, you know, I think the same is true of teaching. I think most non-teachers underestimate how difficult it is to be a good teacher. It's really hard. Um, you know, I had a brother who was an elementary school principal for many years. And so I had, I got a kind of insight into that world. Man, like you, you know, the, to do it, to do, to walk into a classroom of eight-year-olds and keep them interested and entertained and learning day in, day out for nine months, that's like, there is nothing I do that that's, that's, that, that, that's uh, that hard. Um, so that's sort of, that and I wanted to give that same appreciation for people who fight wars. It's just like, it's really easy to judge after the fact, but man, walk a mile in their shoes. Um, and that's really what the bomber mafia was an attempt to do. I have, I have a theory that, you know, we study something like the civil war or you study something like uh, the second world war. We, we have these sort of very simple historical narratives, right? The civil war is about slavery. You know, we dropped the atomic bomb on Japan to save millions of casualties from the invasion. And then, you know, then you do a little bit more research. You, you actually, you realize, oh, wow, this is very complicated. There's all these factors. There's a bunch of stuff you weren't told about. Um, you know, it turns out, hey, Lincoln, you know, wasn't was opposed to slavery, but not really opposed to slavery. And look at all these horrible quotes. And then you go, yeah, but actually, maybe it wasn't going to be a million people who died in the invasion. And actually, Japan was almost going to surrender. You, you start to hear that stuff. It gets really complicated. But then you research, you do another level of research and you really get into the minds of the people who were there at the time. You read the primary sources. Weirdly, it kind of becomes simple again. You're like, oh, the Civil War really just entirely was about slavery. And really, they were looking at the horrendous human costs of invading Japan after all of these island invasions. And that's why they made the decision again. So it's this weird thing where it's simple, then hopelessly complex. And then 
weirdly what comes out of it is a kind of simplicity, but it's a different kind of simplicity. It's not the patriotic propagandistic simplicity, but you do kind of end up getting to roughly the same place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting there. It's the layers. It's funny how different levels of kind of experience and expertise give you dramatically different perspectives on um, the tasks that you're, and you have this, it's like a, what you're describing is uh, a U-shaped curve, right? That, um, and you start out in, at baseline some, somewhere, you, the curve goes up and you're moving on and then you just come back to baseline. <laughs> it's like, there's a lot of, I, which book, there was one of, one of my books where I talked a lot about U-shaped curves and how, how, um, how commonly they describe our experience and how infrequently we understand that we're just riding this curve and it's gonna be confusing. Um, you know, the, the classic U-shaped curve is, um, uh, I remember that's, it's right. I was talking about this with respect to class size and education. Uh, large classes are bad. We all know that. Then you make the class, as you make the class smaller, the, the task of learning gets easier and easier and easier. But then when the class gets too small, learning gets harder again. And people don't understand this. They think, they think it's just a straight line. It, that, and you'll hear fancy schools say, we have you know, one teacher for every eight kids. Well, I'm sorry, a class full of eight kids is a bad learning environment. You're only learning from seven other kids. That's crazy. Why would you cut yourself off in a class of 25 kids? You learn from 24 other kids. What's better, learning from seven or learning from 24, right? How do you have a meaningful discussion about anything with seven kids, seven other kids? You can't, like I could go on. Teachers hate teaching. I talked to all these teachers, so it was so fascinating. I was like, what's your ideal class size? I never met a, a single teacher who thought an ideal class size was less than about 18. Really? They, I, they, were, they were just like, particularly when they were teaching hard subjects, they were like, you, you try and teach history to, a, to seven kids and man, you will have a lot of, and they also talked about how hard discipline is, in, which I thought was so counterintuitive. Discipline's really hard with 35 kids, but it's also really hard with seven, right? Because sure. one, kid, one kid can just dominate. And you cannot get away from that one kid. And there's no way to cancel out the effect. It's like the three kids in the backseat of the station where I could drive across country. You're screwed if they don't get along. I kind of feel like your books actually kind of apply to this too, where it's like, you know, uh, here's the theory behind the tipping point, or here's the theory behind, you know, it takes 10,000 hours to become a master of something. And then people are like, but look at all this research that says it's much more complicated than that. And then you keep researching and then maybe you try it yourself and you're like, sure, but it does take thousands of hours to be good at something. Like it's, it, it, it's, it's, you get back to the same place. And I think people often hear this, that sort of conclusion and they assume that you have disregarded all this information. And it's like, no, that was integrated into the conclusion. And of course there's edge cases and exceptions that prove the rule, but generally this is a pretty good hypothesis or theory for going through the world. And yeah. by saying, no, 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 it's more complicated. You're not actually proposing anything different or arguing against it. You're just pointing out what, what actually exists. Like my, I have this book, Ego is the Enemy and, and people go, but, but sometimes ego is a good thing. And you're like, you think I didn't think about that once writing, you know, a, a 300 page book about this topic? Of course. <laughs> but generally, as a rule, this is something that yeah. I feel strongly enough about to have tattooed on my arm. OK, like I, 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 I did the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. I feel like with the the bombing of Japan, this is probably very politically incorrect, but I've the more I've read about World War II, the more I've read about like MacArthur, for instance, and just how brutal a lot of these campaigns were. I almost wonder if there's kind of a perverse racism at play where it's it's like nobody feels as strongly about the bombings of Europe. Right. Because we have this sense of who the Nazis were, how real and threatening that was. And I think there's also just like the, 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 the image we have of the Nazis is one thing, 
And, and, and then when we think about Japan, we have trouble getting ourselves into the headspace of where the world was in regards to Imperial Japan in 1940. We have trouble conceiving of people being very scared and taking the, the threat of the Japanese army as seriously as the people who actually fought it in those jungles mm -hmm. came to take it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there, well, there's two, in, there's, there's a whole series of things that are playing into this. One is that there was legitimately a very, very wide swath of racism in our attitudes towards the Japanese in during the Second World War. So did, if you just read, you know, the letters and statements of military leaders during the Second World War about the Japanese, they didn't think of them as human. Now, simultaneously, there is an observation that is accurate, which was the fighting between the Japanese and the Americans was far more vicious than the kind of fighting that was taking place in Europe. That, the, you know, the, if you just read about like the Pacific theater and what was going on, I mean, the insane casualties and a complete unwillingness on the part of the Japanese to surrender even when all was lost. I mean, so that's the mindset heading into the 1945 is that these guys never give up. And if you are fighting an enemy who has shown no sign that they will ever give up, even in the face of overwhelming odds, you have a very different problem on your hands, right? right. I mean, the Germans, they were factions of the German army that tried to, remember that broke away from Hitler and tried to make an independent approach to the allies sure. in 40, I don't know what it was, 42 or 43, you know. Um, so it's like the German, the, you know, a whole bunch of Germans wanted to give up, you know, years yeah. before the end of the war. Nobody on the Japanese side was trying to break away and petition for peace in 1943. So you know, you've got these two problems. One is that we do have a genuinely racist attitude. And two, we have this, this really difficult experience in fighting in that theater. And those two things come to a head in 45. Um, and um, again, it's just a, yeah, that's part of, that's sort of the, backdrop for the story I was trying to tell in Bomber Mafia that leads to this just impossible set of decisions. Well, no, and, and what I'm saying is there's almost a soft bigotry today where we have the inability to conceive of Japan as a dire uh, existential threat that people legitimately felt yeah. it necessary to drop an atomic bomb. It, it seems like we see ourselves as America now, Japan, today and we go how could truman have been so so cruel how could he have been so awful because we 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 can't conceive of what the dynamic was in 1945 yeah 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 i think that's that i think that's true. i mean this is why this is why we read history you know mm -hmm. you um it's just in, insanely valuable to get a kind of course in um, how differently people thought about whatever the subject of the history is um, in the period you're under, like you can't, you cannot extrapolate back from 2021 to 1945. You yeah. just can't, right? There's, there's, I feel like there's also an analogy to the U.S. Civil War where sort of the, the breakthrough of the U.S. Civil War is Sherman realizing that the backbone of the Southern army is the Southern people, that, that there is this war machine that's being sustained by an entire culture that is in line with the aims of its army. Now, there's certainly an element of that in Germany, but there's also a degree to which Germany is sort of captured by the Nazis, which were all, always a very small minority, mm -hmm. and sort of they, they take hold of the levers of the state and, and use them for these horrible aims. So the, the population is guilty in that they don't rise up against it, but but it's not it's not the, quite the same as Japan, which seemed to a certain degree to be a culture in line with an entire maybe I'm generalizing a little bit. But there there was a there was a need to take the war to the enemy in the Pacific theater that 
for whatever reason, was not quite as necessary in the European theater, or am I incorrect? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I don't think you're incorrect at all. I mean, I think that, you know, the at the heart of the Bomber Mafia is the argument that logistically the war also, you're trying to fight an enemy who is, who is on an island thousands of miles away. And like, that's, you know, my story is all about these pilots and who are given this assignment to bring Japan to its knees. And it's an assignment very different from the assignment given the Air Force or the Army um, in Europe. It's, you know, you're just in it, when you're bombing Berlin and you're flying from airfields in southern uh, England, you're, you know, it's you cross the English Channel and it's a couple of hours in, you turn around and come home. Japan is like, we couldn't even touch it until we, until we took Guam um, in uh, the summer of 44, we couldn't even get there. Like it, it's just too far away. I mean, yeah. we, it, we forget now you can go wherever you want. I mean, now the B-2 takes off from Kansas and gone, bombs Kosovo and then comes home and the, the pilot has dinner. Right. Right. That night. Yeah. It was, you couldn't do that back then. So you have this in the whole um, that whole part of the war is consumed with this logistical question of how do I get close enough to Japan to do damage to their war making machinery, right? And it's just like getting, I mean, I just found getting into those questions and into that world to be so fascinating. I mean, it's just like the, um, the insane amount of effort that went into that war is just, it's just mind blowing. Is, so is LeMay a genius or is he a hammer and a nail? As I, I wrote about the Cuban Missile Crisis a lot in my last book, and it was fascinating. You can listen to the, they recorded a lot of the discussions between Kennedy and the Joint Chiefs, and you listen to LeMay and you're like, has this guy lost his mind? Like he thinks we're just gonna bomb Cuba off the map and Russia's not gonna respond. And then you, you sort of go, where was this guy's head, you know, 10, 15 years earlier, was he, did he lose his mind? Did he, did he learn the wrong lesson from Japan or was he crazy the whole time? And it just lined up with what the horrible job that needed to be done. There's a, one of the pilots, one of the um, uh, Air Force historians I talked to uh, talking about LeMay said, um, he's like, uh, Curtis LeMay did not stick his landing. It, meaning he, the second half of his career is pretty bizarre. And I think it's pretty clear that he goes, I talk about it in the book, LeMay goes rogue in the summer of 45. You know, he has, he starts out with this, the firebombing of Tokyo in, in, the, in the spring, and then he keeps going and he firebombs basically every big city in Japan with the, with the exception of, of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, of course, which are being reserved for another kind of bombing. And, it's really, I read this fascinating paper by a historian who points out like, he's not, he's on his own. He's not, he's not carrying out orders from Washington. He just kind of goes rogue and just starts burning, napalming everything he can. Um, and he never, something happens to him. Early in the war, he is this brilliant tactician who is largely responsible for the effective bombing of Europe in, um, in 43 and 44. By the time he gets to Japan, something happens. And then his career after the war takes off and he becomes head of the strategic command and then ultimately he becomes chief of staff of the Air Force. And he, I think you're right. I think he's nuts by the end. I really yeah. do. I wonder if it goes back to the 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 distance thing you were talking about. Is it, have you read the William Manchester biography of, of MacArthur? No, I haven't. Oh, it's incredible. But he basically argues that never before in American history and maybe going back not until the Romans, do you get like an analogy where MacArthur is basically a, a proconsul of the empire. He just rules the Pacific theater because it's so far away. Like Truman go, has to go and visit him. But it's like Truman is visiting another head of state like MacArthur just has his own universe over there because it's so inconceivably far away, so far from our preconceptions of 
of, you know, our, our, our shared culture with Europe, for instance, that, that the guys just kind of were on their own and they did, I don't want to say lose their minds, but they just, it's, it's like, um, you know, they were so far up river that they just, they just went, uh, oh, went crazy. So, so apocalypse now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so last, last question for you, this is going to touch the third rail, I think, I, cause I love the new book, uh, but go back to what we were talking about with athletes. I am fascinated by sports. You have these athletes who are always, who are willing to do anything that will give them the slightest edge. They'll put, if they can get away with it, they'll put the most obscene things in their body. You know, they'll do anything for an edge. And then also they're always into like nonsense, you know, like whether it's those, those cups or, you know, they'll, they'll do the most experimental treatments you can imagine, even if the results are not there. How does one explain vaccine hesitancy in professional sports. I think it's, it's the, if we can unlock this, it might help explain vaccine hesitancy in the rest of the world. Uh, well, so are you talking about John Rom? I'm talking about John Rom, uh, Cole Beasley, who, who, uh, who plays for the bills just came out with a big thing. He was like, you know, the odds of me getting COVID are lower than the odds of me making the NFL. I'm going to, you know, I, I'm just going to continue my street. There's a bunch of players who are opposed either to vaccines or, or protocols, only like uh, two thirds of, of um, major league baseball is at 85%, uh, you know, vaccinated. So, so what's interesting for sports is not just the individual advantage, like for John Ron, like he loses $2 million, but like a team that's fully vaccinated can relax protocols and then function more effectively as a team. They could have meetings together. They can travel together. They can go out and tap, you know, there's so many incentives lining up to get athletes to vaccinate aside from your sort of basic civic duty as a human being, I would argue. And yet it's, it's, it's perhaps less widespread in sports than other, yeah. other domains. Well, you're, you're going up against the, um, the, you're dealing with young men in the, in the, almost entirely here who are had been raised to feel physically not just superior to all those around them but also invulnerable sure right? if you're playing football and you're worried about the riskiness of what you're doing you can't play football right um, so i don't you know it's a difficult thing for them to grapple with an unseen threat particularly when they're you know their whole identity is wrapped around their their physical prowess john rom is a harder one for me to understand because it's like you knew the rules. Like, yeah, dude. I mean, he even could have run out and gotten vaccinated after he was up by three shots after the first day. Like, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of. I agree with you. It makes no sense whatsoever. But um, there is this kind of macho thing too, that like you know, f it, man. I can deal with this. Um, I'm you know, I'm a tough guy. I'll be fine. And by the way, you know, they probably uh, will be fine. Probably will be fan. Only people, I worry about football. I mean, I do think that linemen in football are precisely the kind of people who are very vulnerable to. Sure, COVID. sure. Um, if I'm a big right tackle and I'm not vaccinated, man, am I taking a risk? And then I, and also, what I, also adding to your point, um, the you look at the NBA players who had COVID, like Jason Tatum was on the sideline taking oxygen like it seemed like months after he had COVID. I mean, you have to look around you. You see like Jason Tatum is as, you know, spectacular and and um, an athlete as exists in the world. I mean, if you talk about an invulnerable, perfect physical specimen, that's Jason Tatum. And that guy was laid low by COVID. Like, so yeah. I don't understand why they wouldn't look at Tatum and just say, oh, okay, I thought I was, I thought I was going to be fine, but man, like, I don't want to, I don't want that to happen to me. Is, I mean, maybe maybe if Tatum had stood up and been really, really, really vocal about it and said to all of his fellow basketball players and fellow athletes, guys, this is crazy. Don't go, don't do right. this. Um, maybe that would have made a difference, but there, there is also a, a level of wimpiness here that I don't understand. I, everyone I know in the business world has had this problem that some portion of uh, their employees haven't gotten vaccinated and they've all just laid down the law. They've just said, right. oh, sorry, you, you have to get it. And it works. People just go, right. There's, I don't understand why, you know, 
why and the NBA just doesn't give a deadline and say you're vaccinated by this deadline or you you're you know it's it like it, it's also kind of revealed our insane attitude towards illness generally I, I was talking to someone uh, with the Yankees who you know they were talking about the covid the the vaccine breakthrough cases that they had there and mm -hmm. so obviously most of the, the players had been vaccinated they reached the level but he was like what happened is a coach came in who thought he just had the flu or a cold right and and so obviously that's insane to do in the middle of the pandemic but it it's it's interesting to me that a guy who works for a team that has you know elite racehorses essentially like elite you know machines that have to be taken care of was fine just introducing germs that he knew he was carrying into this small space like the, our attitude of like, I'm, I'm, I know you travel a lot and so, where you're just like, oh yeah, I'm sick several days a year. This is just a normal thing that we do and go out in the world. I think the pandemic has kind of reminded us like, oh, hey, that's like a really selfish and stupid and self-defeating thing to do that we just go around getting each other sick instead of yeah. like taking a day off. Yeah. It may be, we have massively undersold this vaccine. That's yes. also part of the problem. It's um, magic. It's uh, akin to the moon landing. It's it's, uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, we have just witnessed one of the greatest scientific accomplishments of our lifetime. I mean, this is, I mean, it's insane. I don't think that story should have been told aggressively. Instead, we were telling all of these kind of like weird, like, I don't know. It's like, I don't know why we, we suddenly got shy about tooting our own horn here. Like this was... This was a chance to stand up and say, for the last two generations in America, we have invested billions of dollars into building the greatest scientific institution, infrastructure, institutional infrastructure in the history of mankind. Guess what? It just paid off. Yes. Right. And it was with these guys in the main. I mean, there were some, obviously, some of these people are, are not from America, but, you know, there's a, in all of these mRNA stuff. It, you know, NIH and American schools are all complicit. You know, this is your tax dollars educated these people, right? This is why we have government. Like we could have stood up and said, guys, I know you complain about your paying taxes and you complain about government, but it, dude, look just what happened. You produced a miracle. miracle. You produced it. You paid for it, right? And we promised you when you did that, that one day it would pay it off. And guess what? It just paid off, right? Oh. Why did no one make that argument? Well, and I would also argue is I, after I do this, I'm going, I volunteer at this vaccine clinic in the, in the town that I live in. Like logistically, also a miracle. Like we've given out 160, 70 million shots to 300 million people, a lot of whom were, you know, located in extremely rural or, you know, difficult to reach areas. And it wasn't the federal government that did it necessarily. It was this massive distributed, right. you know, uh, interconnected network of giving a, you know, they're, they're injecting a shot that has to be kept at an insane temperature and done just the right way. And that how few side effects there have been and how rarely it's gone wrong. Like also logistically, like we did an incredibly hard thing to together. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's been, I'm, I think we'll, you know, I think we're going to get there. Um, I also think that, um, uh, when we come out with patches, I mean, a lot of problems, a lot of people are scared of needles and just don't want to admit it. Yes. It's yes. A, it's a huge part of this. When we start, you know, these transdermal patches are actually a more effective way of delivering the vaccine. And if I just told you, can you slap on this patch for a day? I feel like we could get up to, you know, we, that would make a big, big difference. I was, it was, I started asking my friends about this. Um, uh, you know, all people who ended up getting vaccinated and the number of them who said, I have a pathological fear of needles. It was really hard for me. It, was, it surprised me. It's not a trivial thing. I think that's why we give them to kids because they don't have a choice. So you get it done early and then you can't overthink it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you, to, to go back to, to your point about there's a, a, a wimpiness where we can't just mandate it. When you look at like how they solved tough problems in the Second World War, for instance, 
I struggle to think that they'd be like, hey, this vaccine is voluntary. Let's just uh, see if like, don't you think logistically we would have figured out a way to, you know, well, that think about how we we um, we did po mass polio vaccinations in the 60s. They the the you know, a group of nurses would show up at your school. Set up shop in the auditorium and they would march every single kid in line through and you would get your shot. Like this, there's no kind of consulting with parents and getting them to sign forms and taking notes and like considering objections. You lined up, you got shot. And then we got rid of one of the scariest, you know, uh, diseases of that era. That's, you know, for better or worse, we're much more cautious these days about it. But I just wonder whether the pendulum was swung too far and we just yeah, it, we're overthinking this just just like just go to schools and just do every kid in the afternoon and then go to the next school and do every kid the next morning i mean that's that is the way to do it well it's it's like even voluntary in the military right now and the military only has like a 50 percent vaccination rate it's it's like it's crazy to me that the one place where the government does have essentially complete control over people it's it's wavering and it's just it's a strange it yeah. means something. I don't know exactly what it means. It could mean a good thing, but it seems like it's probably a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's troubling. Well, I love the new book. It's uh, it's amazing. I love all the books. Uh, one other complaint. I feel like it's unfair, both you and David McCullough, to be both great writers and then also to have very interesting voices. Uh, uh -oh. it, it's a, it's an it's an unfair. It's an unfair advantage uh, that uh, I very much enjoy listening to revisionist Thank history. Um, Ryan, when I'm next um, in Austin, we should go for a run. Although I, I suspect you're much faster than me. Is this true? I, I, I don't think that that's true. Uh, I think your mile time recently was my mile time in high school. So uh, that that's pretty impressive. But I would love to, I would love to run with you or or in New York or if we're both in D.C., let's run with uh, with David Epstein. Yes, that'd be really fun. Have you run with David? Uh, have you run with Rich Roll? No, I haven't. He's, but he's. I mean, he's serious. He's very serious. But, but, uh, yeah, yes. I would love to. I'm. I mean, I think this kind of the great thing about Strava now is that sometimes when I travel, I'll post a run, and then locals will see it. And I was in Phoenix, and I posted a run in Phoenix. And all these guys like, come and join us Sunday morning, and I joined. It was like, and when, it was so much fun because, you know, they knew you know, this insane route through the foothills of Phoenix past all these incredible, you know, houses and down this wonderful trail. And it was just like, I was like, oh, this is like, this is actually what the internet's for. We think the internet is for, you know, X, Y, and Z. No, it's just not. It's what the internet's for is finding people to go for a run on a Sunday morning in a city you don't know. That's the best part. The only the downside is you are like telling people exactly where you live because it's like, oh, conveniently, Malcolm seems to be leaving and coming back. Oh, I, don't, the exact I, don't post, I don't I don't post those runs. I don't. Post okay. Them. You, so you only do Cause I only do it when I'm traveling for the same reason. I just don't do it from my, from my well, house. I, I rarely run from my hands because I have to go. So, right. Know, you know, the general area, but you, you can't figure out where I live from my Strava. That, did you see that study where they found that they were accidentally like revealing the locations of secret military and CIA bases through Strava? I love that so much. I love Strava. <laughs> Strava is just the best. <laughs> it, 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 to it totally is. Uh, well, Malcolm, thank you very much. Can't wait to meet you someday and uh, yeah. appreciate all the books. Good. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah.